People think of economics as the dismal science, right? Mm -hmm. Economists like John Stuart Mill were against slavery and Carlyle was, was for it. And the term dismal has a deeply racist connotation because it's associated with darkness and the devil and mm -hmm. hell. And so it was that oblique reference to like the dark skin of the slaves. If you look at you know, people are hesitate to vaccinate themselves and their kids, the missing piece of the puzzle is the trust. Many people don't trust their government and if you you want to accomplish things what you want to pay attention to is what does the levels of trust look like here pairing themselves to others is like a massive mistake if your sense of value and self-satisfaction is premised on having a nicer car than your neighbor you can get that by buying a nicer car but if your neighbor thinks the same way there's going to be like an arms race relative to each other you haven't gained anything but you've sacrificed a ton of other consumption and leisure time. And so that's like a massive mistake. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast where we deliver real talk on tech with a dash of D minus comedy. If you like the type of stuff, hit that like and subscribe button. Today we are joined by Eric Agner. Did I say it correctly? There's two ends in there and I probably you butchered sure it. did. Yeah. It's fantastic. My last name's Thibodeau, which is like, you do it correctly. You win Scrabble every time. <laughs> Joe's a straightforward Tornaski, a blue collar man's man name, but you know, mine's a little more difficult. It's a spelling challenge. Exactly. Um, so Eric, we're super happy to have you here. You wrote this fantastic book called economics can save the world. Now, That's right. fun fact that I think is fun that people don't really probably care about is I thought I was going to go into, um, well, I thought I was going to go to economics, and then I heard about econometrics. I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't speak Spanish. So I decided <laughs> to go into political science. But what I wanted to really do was go into political economy because back in the old yeah. days, Adam Smith was like, hey, well, that you know more than I do, Eric. But my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, was that like, if you understand the economics but don't understand the politics, then you don't know how to get anything done. If you understand just the politics, but don't know how to know the economics, then you're just going to push out theory, uh, political theory that goes nowhere and destroys your society. So <laughs> it seemed like somewhere in like the 1800s, there was kind of like a branch off where economics got more specialized in macro micro, and then political science got into their own areas of foreign policy, domestic government politics, and things like that. But anyways, uh, I really enjoyed your book because there are some people who write books that are like, I'm just writing this so I can get tenure. And this is basically me getting a research paper and then just ramming it into your brain with no loop. <laughs> and it's terrible to read. This book is super duper approachable, but I I haven't read an economic book so good since I read Freakonomics. So I'm thank you. Thank, thank you, you so for writing such a solid book. Um, yeah, yeah so part of what with the background is that like economics has taken this real formal turn, right? Interdisciplinarity was gone for a long time. Everyone mm. was like working in their silos and so on. And um, things have changed. And uh, one of the things that I'm trying to change is sort of to highlight that and also to bring economics and philosophy back together again, because they used to be one and the same, right? Mm -hmm. Back in the day of Adam Smith, there was no distinction between the two disciplines at all. And now, sadly... Uh, the disciplines don't really talk to each other. So part of what I was trying to do was to bring them together again and to show that these things really matter to each other. What's the, what's the consequence of these things uh, specializing and diverging? Uh, the consequence of uh, the disciplines diverging? Yeah, like you're trying to, you're trying to bring it back together. I presume right. you have some critique in mind. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so the consequence of the fields diverging is that you get this professionalization. You get like separate disciplines where people talk mainly to one another. They settle on certain techniques and certain methods. They settle on a language. And this is normal and fine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, division of labor, as Adam Smith would have said, right? There's mm -hmm. a reason why we have these like sub disciplines and the sciences. But one consequence that's sort of unfortunate is that people don't understand each other anymore mm -hmm. across disciplines. And they don't quite see like the relevance of what people are doing elsewhere. And then there's sometimes this like disdain and, you know, <laughs> uh, attitude problem here and there. That's which, not real you know, science. <laughs> the less said about that, the better. But then like part of where I start with the book is suppose you care about a big problem and it really doesn't matter which big problem you start with. It's got to have like some economic consequences, right? Or mm -hmm. economic presuppositions, climate change, poverty, discrimination, unhappiness happiness, overconfidence, like all of these things have economic aspects, but you can't fix them 
merely with social science, right? Social science itself isn't going to tell you how to make the world a better place. For that, mm -hmm. you need values, right? You need normative reflection. You need ideas about justice and fairness and welfare and equality and things like that. And that's what mm -hmm. you get from philosophy. And then you talk about economic thinking and the economic way of thinking. I think a lot of us are, are thought that, oh, economic thinking is GDP, inflation, and whatnot. And we don't think that no economic thinking is much more than that maybe you can go into that yeah. and how it applies to our day to day mm -hmm. i think of economics more as an approach to solving problems than anything else it's like a way of thinking it's a way of structuring your thought and that involves thinking in terms of the decision the decisions that we're facing you know as individuals and as societies it involves thinking in terms of the trade-offs as in what if i go for this thing over here you know what am i going to have to give up over here in order to get that. It involves thinking on the margin, as people say, thinking in terms of like incremental units and how things change when you do that. It involves thinking in terms of equilibria, that is like thinking through the consequences of changes and how people will react to those changes. None of this is like particularly deep once you, you get what it's about, but there's like a package of tools, a package of methods that economists mm. tend to use. And the power of them is that you can apply them to virtually anything and you can get, I think, fresh insights to that way. Hey, it's book giveaway time. We have three copies of book to give away. I'm too lazy to do this re-recording. So instead, I'm not going to mention the name of the book, so I don't have to record this again. But we have two uh, copies for our supporters. So if you go over to Discord and your supporter, just go to our DC Merch Book giveaway channel and look for the latest giveaway we're doing. And then all you got to do is do a thumbs up. And if you want to make sure that you get notified for future book giveaways, do a book emoji right here. Um, now, if you are a free member, we have one free book to give you. All you got to do is go to patreon.com forward slash SVIC, become a free member, and then go to the recent book raffle and just write a comment. Hey, I want a book. And then you're in. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well said. Um, what, what are your top three, like, um, uh, economic concepts? I have mine. I'm very, <laughs> oh, very man. biased. Well, so I find like every so often, like journalists will call and they'll ask about some weird thing that's going on, right? <laughs> um, and I find about half the time, the answer is like opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. So um, Correct answer during the pandemic, <laughs> there were all these like arguments about, against young people, right? Why are young people out there not following instructions? You know, why are they hanging out with each other in dorms rather than like isolating or whatever? Are young people sort of deficient? Are they like genetically inferior to the rest of us old guys. Um, and obviously that's not true, right? The way to understand why young people behave differently in during the pandemic relative to people like me is to think about the costs of behaving differently, right? Socially isolating is basically what I do anyway as a father of youngish <laughs> children, right? I don't go out dancing and stuff. It doesn't cost me anything not to go out dancing. Young people though, who live at home, right? We're in small mm -hmm. dorms uh, where some people have to deal with domestic violence and drug abuse and so on within the household, right? It costs them a lot more to stay in. So in the, this way, mm. when you think about the trade-offs that people face and the decisions that they have to make, sometimes you can understand quite easily like why people do different things. And mm -hmm. that's the idea of, of an opportunity cost. It's like literally the first thing you might learn if you take yep. a microeconomics <laughs> course, as you guys uh, you know, no, but um, nonetheless, it's like such a powerful idea. I first thing another... you learn, first thing you learn, but you don't fully understand or grasp. I, it I, I'm takes... still, I heard about it when I was like 19, yeah. but I'm still don't grasp the concept. Yeah. Most companies, most <laughs> you people forget don't. to apply it. Eric, yeah. I cut you off. What was your second? Yeah, another thing that's really cool and really useful is the concept of an equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And so here's an example, right? There was a newspaper um, headline near where I live that said something about there's a mystery here in our town. The city decided to ramp up parking enforcement, and yet they collected less revenue. <laughs> uh, they expected to make a ton more money, but they didn't. You know, they lost mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. on this. And this is a massive mystery, right? Mm -hmm. But thinking in terms of equilibria, 
means like thinking in terms of the consequences of people adapting to the sort of thing that happens. So suppose the city ramps up parking enforcement. What's going to happen? Well, in the short term, there's going to be a lot of tickets, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to have more revenue in the short term. But in the next step, the drivers will notice that they're getting a lot of tickets. It's not the sort of thing that passes by unannounced, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you're going to get these tickets and then you're going to adapt. You're going to park legally. You're not going to drive. You're going to you know, stay at home, whatever. And then as a result of that adaptation, there's going to be fewer tickets and less revenue. So once you mm -hmm. think through like the consequences of your actions and people adapting to those consequences, you might find that the outcome is very different from what you thought it it would be. Another example that comes to mind a lot is that there are all these discussions, um, again, where I live about bike lanes, like should you have more bike lanes or whatever. And whenever I get in a cab, like almost every time I get in a cab, the driver wants to whine about all the bike lanes and how <laughs> they're taking space away from the, from the cars, right? And to some extent, the drivers are right. You know, when you build a bike lane, normally it takes space mm -hmm. away from the, the drivers. Mm -hmm. But of course, like the hope is that you can move people from the cars to the bikes. I don't know if this always happens this way, right? But it might. If you get a couple of people out of their cars and onto their bikes, you're going to leave a lot more space for the professionals who have to be on the road. The disabled people, you know, can't get on a bicycle and get to work and, and so on. And so mm -hmm. whenever you're thinking about social change, you're thinking about a policy, you have to think through not just like the first step in the sequence, but you have to think through like as many steps as it takes mm -hmm. until you end up in a situation that's like somewhat stable. And that's what economists call an equilibrium. How do you remind yourself to do that? Because I remember at, at Salesforce, um, I, so I was at Slack. We got acquired by Salesforce, unfortunately, not a great company. Uh, but <laughs> they were trying to get people to come back to the office. And so someone, some person was like, I have an idea. We'll say that every time someone from Salesforce comes to the office, we'll give $10 to a charity. And everyone's like, high five. And then it got announced. And you would have showed that to anyone else in the company said, wait a minute. We just posted that we're making billions of dollars of money, and now we're advertising. We're giving like a couple hundred bucks to charity if our employees come to work. Uh, that's not a good look. So how do you remind yourself like, okay, I made my plan, but how can I think forward about possible <laughs> ramifications for my plan? It's not that deep, right? And this is part of the power of the economic way of thinking. Like this is something that anyone can do. You don't have to be a professional economist to think in these terms. It's the sort of thing you can just like train yourself to reflect on. You take one more moment and say to yourself, well, what now, right? What's gonna happen now? And then, um, you know, that'll give you the answer. It's interesting. I didn't think of this as, uh equilibrium thinking, or at least I didn't call it that. I've always thought of it as a static analysis and a dynamic analysis. Hmm. But, but as you started describing it, it reminded me of all the discussions in the States about tax policy. Mm. Our friend, you know, we go through this curve. every time. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen examples. Yeah. I mean, it's an obvious application, right? You want to tax people while well, boom, you increase the tax rate. You expect to get a certain revenue, but you can't stop the analysis right there. You then have to ask, well, now what, what are people going to do? Are they going to keep working mm -hmm. uh, the same amount? Well then fine, right? You're good, but are they going to work less? Well, then you have to take that into account and, and keep going. Um, I mean, the same thing is true really wherever you look, right? You look at immigration policy or something, mm -hmm. people are going to adapt. They're not dumb, right? They're going to take into account what you're doing and um, adapt to this. People make fun of the idea of like rational economic man or whatever. And it's true that we're not like a, a automata like that, right? We don't behave like that. But it's nonetheless true that people respond to incentives. When things change, people adapt. And so when we analyze sort of big changes like this, big policy changes, we have to take that into account. Nice. I so wanted to go back to your example of uh, during the pandemic, like young people basically deciding this is not a good trade for me. Um, you also, I think you mentioned this a few times in the book, but the experts sort of made their predictions about what was going to happen as the pandemic unfolded. And I think their record is pretty questionable at this point. And I'm guessing that a lot of, especially younger people, probably think less of their opinions at this stage <laughs> than they did before the pandemic. 
How do you account for that in an economic model? Is that like a kind of externality? Like what do we, how do we think about it? Well, so one point when this comes up in the book has to do with overconfidence, right? And this mm -hmm. tendency that we have to sort of exaggerate our belief in our own abilities. So by and large, we overwhelmingly, you know, we're not as good as we think. We're not as, <laughs> you know, right as often Present as we believe excluded, we are. Of course, Eric. Yes, 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 of course, right? <laughs> the <clears> exception <throat> is like very easy problems. But when it comes to very difficult problems, like predicting what the stock market is going to do, predicting what's going to happen to the unemployment mm. rate, and, you know, predicting how the pandemic is going to develop, we're overwhelmingly overconfident. Um, and there are phenomena, at least sometimes, where experts seem sort of more prone to this. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me what's going to happen to the pandemic or, you know, the next one, whatever, I'm going to say I have no idea. But people who've read up on it might convince themselves that they're actually pretty good at this. Mm. And so at least sometimes you find that experts are like more overconfident than non-experts. And then you have a problem, right? Because politicians go to the experts. They don't know either, but they think they know. And mm. then politicians will feed their estimates into their models or into their like mental idea of what's going to happen next. And then, you know, things might go very poorly. Um, neat thing about this research is that there are kind of interventions that you can adopt to modulate this a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Looking at outcome data, right, really helps making continuous predictions and then checking, was I right last time? Did I ah, mess this, this is up? A list of bets. Uh, right? Not a bad idea. And then thinking in terms of the reasons or thinking about the reasons why you might be wrong. So mm -hmm. reflecting on the scenarios where you'll be totally mistaken. That sort of thing can help you like modulate your overconfidence a, a little bit. And you would wish that more experts and non-experts alike, <laughs> in fact, would think in those terms. Right. You I have an article on this about uh, epistemic humility, I think. Yeah, yeah. So that's this idea that we should take a certain, we should have a certain degree of modesty with respect mm. to our own beliefs and, um, you know, the information that we're, uh, that we've adopted, uh, the background is that like everything we know is effectively provisional, right? Everything mm -hmm. is subject to revision in the light of new evidence. And we don't always in practice take that into account to the extent that, that we should, that we should. So mm. epistemic humility is just this idea that you should have a certain degree of humility and modesty toward your own sort of epistemic states, the things that you believe and, and mm. think you know. What makes us lose epistemic humility? Well, the default seems to be to not have it in the first place. Like people are overwhelmingly overconfident. And so if you ask about like anything, really, people turn out to be more confident in their ability than they should be if you mm -hmm. want to be calibrated, as, as people say. If you want like the frequency with which you're correct to mirror the confidence that you have in your mm. judgments. So like a lack of humil humility seems to be the default state. And what we have to do as like responsible knowers is to sort of force ourselves to regulate our degree of humility to map mm. like what we know and what we can't know. Excellent. Uh, let's uh, t talk about also, I mean, there's a lot of great chapters in the book, but you talk about norms. Uh, moral yeah. versus social norms. Maybe you can go into that for us. Yeah. So norms are these like rules and practices that we abide by without really thinking about it. Um, we might think of ourselves as like rational individuals, or we might think of ourselves or other people as habit following in individuals, but to a great extent, like what we are, are norm following individuals. So mm -hmm. think about what happens if you're a foreign country, you're in South Korea for the first time and you're seated at a restaurant and you have all these like wonderful dishes and sauces and implements in front of you. You have no idea <laughs> what to do with all those things. What are you going to do? Well, obviously, right, what you do is you peek over at the person sitting next to you and you try to do what they do, right? We have this like very strong tendency to want to do the same thing as other people do. And, um, you know, these deep dreams that people have, like the nightmares of showing up to oh. 
graduation without pants. Like mm -hmm. that's the power of social norms. Nobody gets hurt if you show up to your graduation without pants, but the amount of pain that you would feel is like the, the pain we associate with the violation of social norms. And so this is really interesting. If you want to understand the behavior, again, to go back to the pandemic, like some people uh, distanced themselves, right? Some people used face masks. Some people took care of like staying home or whatever. Other people didn't. If you want to understand like why some people complied and other didn't, others didn't, the best way to do that is to think in terms of the social norms that they're they're following. Mm -hmm. And if you want to change behavior as well, the way to do that is to sort of shift the social norms that govern our interactions. It's like a very powerful driver of behavior. And as a result of that, it's a very powerful force for change. Norms aren't always good, right? Some norms are very, very bad. You can think about, um, you know, genital mutilation. You can think about um, honor killings or you know these feuds where family members have to restore their honor by like killing somebody from the other family or whatever these mm -hmm. are people who are like deep in the grips of of social norms um, but it turns out that breaking out of that sort of situation is also very often a matter of social norms of establishing a better one instead of the dysfunctional one that people followed in the past. So even if you know you're worried about like st stupid things like the dirty dishes and the sink in the office or like the trash on the floor in the bathroom or something. If you want to do something about that, like thinking about the social norms that govern our interactions is often a good place to start. So you can try to rip out the old norms, but you get to put something else in its place or compel people. Yeah, it's really hard to just like get rid of a norm and yeah. replace it by nothing. Very <laughs> often what you want to do is try to replace it by a more functional norm. Um, and the, the reason why that works is that like we have these like moral intuitions and these moral commitments or whatever, but very often the norm is such a strong driver of behavior. It's a much stronger driver of behavior than your private beliefs. And so the way to shift behavior is to establish a, a better norm. I think people mess this up. In fact, there was a message from my school kids school not a long time ago where the teachers said, you know, we've noticed that there's a norm of there's a code of silence among the students. All of a sudden, like they don't <laughs> tell the teachers about, you know, people cheating on exams and doing mm -hmm. bad things or, or whatever. And the sense I got was that they had gone to the students and said, you know, there's a code of silence now and that's bad. So what they did inadvertently was to go to the students and reinforce mm -hmm. the fact that there's a code of silence, right? Which tells you, here's the norm. And then to add, and this is bad, right? You shouldn't. But that private moral belief can't be expected to like override the power of the norm. And so this wouldn't make any difference, right? What you ought to be doing is like shifting the reference point maybe and mm -hmm. say, look, in our society, uh, uh, being a responsible citizen and, you know, member of the community means speaking up when bad things are happening. That would sort of trigger a totally different norm, right? It would uh, impose a different norm on mm. the students. And I expect that kind of approach to be a lot more powerful in shifting behavior than whatever it is that they did. Well this said. Is a sort of competing norms kind of approach. Look yeah. for one that's overriding. Kind of to your point about things being provisional and situational. Right. And and that works oftentimes because we're members of multiple communities and multiple groups and a norm that applies like in the workplace might be slightly different and at odds with mm. a norm that applies in your religious community or in your mm. golf mm. club or something. And so if you can shift the focus, if you can shift the frame of reference, you can trigger a totally different norm and shift behavior quite quickly. And this is cool because we have this idea that in order to shift behavior, we first have to shift people's values. And shifting values is hard, right? Mm. It might take a lot of time. And also it raises these problems about autonomy and so on, right? Do we have the right to go around like changing people's values? Sounds kind of iffy, but the neat thing about norms is that you can change behavior without changing any values. Like you had those values all along, right? I'm just triggering a different norm that you might not have thought about uh, at mm -hmm. the outset. And you also, I think, describe how sometimes these norms, uh, even though they're fairly stubborn, they can change suddenly. 
That that's right. So norms are kind of cool in the sense that on the one hand they're really stable, right? So you have these communities with like family feuds that have gone on for for <laughs> generations, and nobody really wants these feuds, right? But they go on for generations. And but then like at other times they can shift really quickly. And so I think about fashion here, where in mm. certain ways like fashion is really stable. Um, you go around, you know, the pants are tight or the pants are wide or whatever have you. Like a lot of time, uh, these things are quite stable. But then all of a sudden something happens, right? A trendsetter shifts their mode of dress mm. or a new movie comes out or a new artist emerges. And then boom, it, the fashion can change very quickly. You yeah. leave the country for a few weeks, you come back and like the waistline has shifted. Like it used to be mm. real low, now it's real high. Um, and that sort of illustrates that norms sometimes do change very quickly. And that's a hopeful message, I think, right? Even if you think about the most entrenched, harmful behaviors, there is a possibility of shifting that behavior quite quickly um, if we play our cards right. Well said. Uh, I'm going to uh, get some comments in here. Uh, Fractals, who's one of our members watching, said, I was a sociology major. Social norms were something I learned early in my 20s, and the concept has been foundational in my adult life. Leaving a norm void can cause distress. Yep. They often have a certain function that must be acknowledged, which it brings me to another point. Um, we had Pedro Domingos here, who's an AI professor, and he he was talking about ethics, which is vaguely similar to norms. I'd love to play this clip and love to hear what your thoughts are on this. It's ridiculous. I mean, I'll give you one small example. Yeah, yeah. There's this whole area of, you know, AI ethics, right? Mm -hmm. AI ethics consists of people trying to shoehorn AI into their current ethical systems. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if AI really is the biggest thing since fire, for sure it's going to radically change society, right? Mm -hmm. Think of mm -hmm. the printing press. The printing press led to the Reformation. It led to wars. It led to America and some, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. So my contention is that AI is going to change our ethical principles. Do, do you want my reaction to that? Yeah, yeah I'd love man. to hear what your thoughts are. So yeah. that strikes me, you know, with respect and stuff, as kind of confused. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe AI will change lots of things. It probably will, right? Um, but the fact that sort of conditions shift in the world doesn't necessarily mean that our ethical foundations need to shift at all. So think of, suppose utilitarianism is right, and we have a, a duty to promote the total amount of good in the world. Maybe in the presence of AI, the way you go about promoting the good in the world will shift. All of a sudden, like old behaviors won't be functional anymore. Um, there are new things that we can do that will truly really enhance the total amount of well-being or welfare in the world. But that doesn't need to shift. There's no reason to think that that will shift to the underlying ethical normative principles. You see the, the difference, right? Things change in the world, mm. but that doesn't need mean that our ethical presuppositions, presuppositions will, will shift at all. Yeah. So you say it's confused, like you're sort of pointing out there's a, a kind of level error. I think it's confusing like the descriptive and the normative. So sure, you study AI, you study the changes that that's going to lead to in society, and I'm not denying that they're going to be radical, but there's no particular reason to think that those changes will shift the duties we have toward each other, like the duties we have toward animals and the, you know, the environment and, and so on. Um, I think that's just a, oh, this is a mistake. Do you, do you anticipate that we would have duties towards artificial intelligences? I, so this is not quite my area. So I'm on thin ice no, here. Go for it, though. Um, people often feel that way, I think. Like they start to relate toward robots and artificial AI systems as though they were human beings and so on, right? People apologize to their iPhone when it speaks to them with a voice and, and whatever. Um, so it might shift people's feelings. Um, maybe we will think of ourselves as having duties to artificial systems in, in the long run. Um, I don't know. There's no necessity, certainly, of that happening. Interesting. Um, I, I'd love to talk to you about, um, you have a chapter called Economics, uh, or how to give people what they need. And you talk about economics mm. and values. Uh, I'd love for you to go into that. 
Yeah, so um, economists have for a long time been quite keen to draw, to keep their distance from normative reflection and values and and so on, right? There's this idea that in order to be scientific, you need to sort of get rid of all the values and, mm. um, you know, to be a real mature adult science, uh, you have to not engage with, with values at all. But that view was never quite sort of sustainable. I mean, values matter in all sorts of ways. And um, sort of one cool thing that happened was that a um, an economist, um, economics Nobel laureate Al Roth um, gave a presentation as a president of the American Economic Association, where he um, highlighted the role that values play in economics. And he argued against the idea that economists shouldn't be reflecting on this at all. Um, his sort of entry point to this was the fact that he works on uh, kidneys and human organs and things. Oh, yeah. And the problem with kidneys is that uh, they're in screeching short supply, right? Lots of people mm. need kidneys, and there just aren't that many uh, kidneys available. Now, you might say, as some economists do, that, well, what we should have is a market, right? We should just like legalize it. We should allow people to put their spare kidneys on eBay, whatever, and then, you know, the market will clear and we'll fix the problem. Um, I'm not saying that wouldn't work. Um, um, neither is Roth, but what Roth is saying is that we're operating, we're not in a vacuum, right? We're operating in a society where people have moral views. And in our society, as in most societies across the world, it's considered sort of disrespectful or despicable to be trading in human organs like kidneys. As mm -hmm. economists, then, we can't just go about telling people they ought to have different values. What we ought to do is figure out how to work within the constraints set by moral convictions. And in a way, this is not like a big step for economists because we're used to maximization within constraints. It's mm -hmm. just that we have to treat people's moral convictions as one of the constraints within mm -hmm. which we're maximizing. Roth is also working in an area called mechanism design, which doesn't ask so much like what's going to happen if we build an economy of a certain kind, but rather you know, what is the outcome we would like to see and what sort of market can we design to get us there? The mm. analysis sort of inverts the normal work order of, of an economist. And if you do that kind of work, you're starting out with a picture of the kind of allocation you would like to see, which is, you know, something that's good. So in Roth's case with the kidneys, you know, he wanted to make sure that everybody who, who felt like donating a kidney could find somebody to donate it to. That's not obvious at all. He wanted, ideally, obviously, everyone who needed a kidney to have access to one. And the question then becomes, like, what sort of exchange mechanism can we build that will maximize the number of kidneys available and that will make sure to make the best possible use of the kidneys that we can that we can get access to and so he set up this um, exchange which was you know a, an algorithm in effect that allocated kidneys in accordance with certain principles that was meant to respect not just like the medical facts about who can get a kidney from whom but also the moral convictions within which we we operate and so the punchline here is that while economists have for a long time sort of try to gain their distance from every mention of like values and things. We really can't do that. Um, you know, we're part of society. We want to contribute to society. We want to help make society better. And if you just look at like the words I just used, it's sort of <laughs> obvious that you can't do that without some degree of reflection about the values um involved this goes back to my point earlier about the value of like combining philosophy and economics right you want to build mm -hmm. a better society right great you want to do it on the basis of the best available economics but you can't do it on the basis of economics alone right you also have to have some sort of value you have to have a, have a vision of what a better society will look like so that you have a way to move uh, toward it right in the right um, direction mm -hmm. Right. I feel like also you could say culture too, irreplaceable for values. Because I noticed um, there's always this old saw about American conglomerates are going to come to developing countries and take over their markets. But then what usually happens is we don't understand the culture. 
and then you have an entrant who understands the culture, could iterate quickly, and creates a following and liking that can actually withstand the competition from the American conglomerates. Um, maybe culture could, is huge, right? I right. mean, in marketing, I don't, I don't know if these stories are true, but there are all these stories about like companies putting like a baby on the outside of the baby food, thinking, you know, everyone will <laughs> like having like a picture of a happy baby, but you sell it in a country where normally you put a picture of the contents of the can on the outside. And then it looks mm -hmm. as though you've got canned babies. Eating kids. Like, <laughs> yeah. That kind of ignorance, right, can doom your entire business. And yet, you know, mm -hmm. allegedly it happens because people don't pay enough attention to right. culture. Mm -hmm. We were doing this at Google once. Um, I forgot the product name, but my friend was telling me we were launching a product in China a long time ago when we still did business in there. And the name of the product we didn't realize translates to basically vagina. And so people, <laughs> people in China are like, what is Google trying to sell us right now? What's going on here? Nice work. I didn't know yeah. that, but there's a car called Nova, right? Another one mm -hmm. of these famous, which in Spanish means it doesn't work or it doesn't go. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, uh, so our show, we talk about tech. I mean, me and Joe talk about our, our, our stories yeah. and our trenches. And I think the when I look at you talking about norms, I think of acquisitions. And when you uh, acquire a company and you bring in the employees into your organization, but you don't have someone in there to explain to them, ah, like our organization, this is our norms, this is how we operate. When, they're, when the managers are saying this, they kind of mm. really mean this. And usually when you have a horse <laughs> whisperer like that, it helps things out. Now, you then go into talking about uh, building better teams and how we can use economics to build better teams. So maybe you can go into that and some tips because we have a lot of managers who listen to the show. Yeah, so this relates to the research on overconfidence, right? And um, mm. overconfidence is this thing. It's, it's got this funny feature, which is that if you ask people, like, the thing that you just said, like, are you quite sure of that? People will often say, yeah, I'm sure of it. You know, I wouldn't have said it if I weren't sure of it, right? But if you ask, like, managers, like, do you have somebody on your team who's maybe like a little too confident who, you know, doesn't know as much as they think they do? Every manager will say absolutely yes, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's even worse than that. If you ask people like in general, are you wrong sometimes? People will quite gladly confess that, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm wrong. But then if mm -hmm. you say the thing you just said specifically, are you wrong about that? They'll say no way, right? 100% no. sure. Um, and so there are like funny things going on here where the individual might not see the need for reflecting on the degree of overconfidence and so on, but managers see it like very clearly. And um, you know, when it comes to overconfidence in particular, it's been implicated in all sorts of disasters, um, uh, nuclear power plant mm -hmm. problems and corporations going uh, belly up and like all sorts of things that, that go wrong. You can often like backtrack a little and you'll find that overconfidence was a factor in the decision. So what can you do in a, in a team? Well, one of the things, as I indicated before, is like, of recognizing or acknowledging reasons that we might be wrong is really super important, right? And that means in the team context, having somebody on the team who's sufficiently contrarian and sufficiently independent um, and sufficiently bold to like speak up sometimes. Um, and this sort of thing is you know, maybe it's innate, but to a greater extent, I think it's under your control. Um, it's under your control in the sense that you mm. decide how you react to people telling you you're wrong, right? Some managers will not tolerate it. There are like instances mm. of like Elon Musk being contradicted on Twitter, right? He's going on about how Twitter X works and an engineer says, well, that's actually not quite right. And what Musk will do is that he'll fire the guy right on the spot. And of course, if you fire everyone who contradicts you, mm -hmm. you're not going to have anyone on your team who's ever going to tell you you're wrong. And what's going to happen? Well, you're going to be inviting a great deal of, of overconfidence. Like you want to establish a culture where it's okay to contradict people. You all, including yourself, mm -hmm. right? If you're the leader, you also want to build a culture where it's okay to say, I don't know, and where it's okay to confess that you made mistakes. And these are things that we can model ourselves, like insofar as we are managers who are managing people or whatever, we can start like today, 
right? Modeling this. If we don't know things, well, then you know uh, we should we should say so. There's a, a PowerPoint slide um, circulating on the interwebs, supposedly from a management consulting company. It's like from an onboarding exercise. I can't judge if this is true, but one of the things that it says is that I don't know is not an acceptable answer. Um, <laughs> if you have that kind of culture, right, where nobody is allowed to say, I don't know, are people magically, mysteriously going to know the answer to every question? Well, obviously not, right? What's going to happen is that people will learn very quickly to fake uh, knowledge of whatever it is that you're asked. So if you signal right up front that I don't know is not a correct answer, you're going to find people like just making things up on the fly. And what's going to happen in the group context, you're going to be much worse as a group um, as a board mm. or whatever at making decisions. Um, for your own benefit, I think it helps. I mean, in my experience anyway, it helps a lot to be able to say, I don't know. When I started teaching at the university level, I was only marginally older than the, the students. And I really felt like I had to have an answer to every question. So there were times when I sort of made something up on the flies and hoping it would work. Sometimes it did, but then sooner or later, you know, you say something that turns out to be false and then you lost face, right? It's embarrassing. It might take you a while to get people's confidence back. By mm. contrast, if you say, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Let me look it up. Or can you look it up? Or best of all, what do you think? Because it turns out that when people ask questions, very often they already have an idea of what the answer is and they're dying to express it, right? Um, so in that way, what seems like, you know, a loss in prestige or something, a confession that you don't know anything can in fact serve to like build trust and confidence in your organization at the same time as you become better at making informed decisions. So here are some like very simple things you can do in a leadership position to build a, a culture that sort of overconfidence proof and it's going to allow you to make much better decisions than you would otherwise. Well said. Yeah, I feel like... Sorry, let me just follow up. There was something sort of funny quite recently that happened where Elon Musk said something on Twitter that he thought was funny, I guess, that people didn't think was funny because it was like horribly racist or sexist or something. And then, <laughs> you know, he deleted it. And afterwards he said, well, this um, landed much better, like in my little group or, you know, in oh. my circle. But of course, if you're the sort of, per sort of person who fires everyone who contradicts you and, mm. you know, you dismiss everyone who doesn't laugh at your jokes, you're going to be surrounded by people who will agree with everything and laugh mm. at everything. And you will have no sense for how mm. your lines will land outside of your organization, right? It's just much better long-term to, to make sure that people dare speak up in your presence. That's true. Yeah, I think it was to do with the, um, the re recent Trump assassination, and he basically came up with like, Why, what's going on with Kamala? Why is there attempts on her? And then he tweeted, you know, he asked his friends what they thought, and they're going, oh, this is hilarious. And That's I right. think the issue he's dealing with is his, his core friend group, the All In podcast, they all want to invest in his next deal. So anything he says, oh. Oh, 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 so good, Elon, that's really good. <laughs> that and, takes some of our money. Right. And if you notice at Tesla, they've gone through a, a significant executive churn. The original execs that were with him, um, like J.D. Straubel and the rest of them, that he That's like, an respected. Uh, sorry, well, they've have gone have gone on, and then um, he had uh, the only executive that's still in his realm that he, I mean, respects, and she challenges Gwen Shotwell. She'll come up to him and challenge him. But other than that, he's basically created this echo chamber here where he just really can't get any real good feedback from people. So. We should all be so lucky as to have <laughs> friends who contradict us. I mean, I have friends who on Facebook will tell me that, you know, I thought that was a lot of line. That was unnecessary. Why did you say that? And it might be annoying in the moment, right? But I'm really grateful that I have people who do that to me. It's sort of checks and balances kind of situation mm -hmm. where, you know, it gives me a sense for how I perform and how I'm perceived in, in the world. I wanted to go back to the discussion of um, organ donation, mm. uh, specifically because you said the first reaction is, hey, we'll create a market. And that's my reaction, too, because I'm a free market, libertarian kind of person, grew up in California, blah, blah, blah. 
But then I also think, yeah, there's certain situations where you've just got to have the government sort of step in and regulate something. But what I thought was really fascinating is you, at least to me, you introduced this whole other idea. I think it's called uh, polycentric governance. Yeah. You got to describe that because I don't think that approach is very well known or or understood. And maybe uh, if you have a chance, talk about this whole swimming association. It's a perfect (laughs) example. Sure thing. Yeah. So this is an idea that's almost like criminally underappreciated. It's Mm -hmm. due to Eleanor Ostrom, who's also like criminally underappreciated in spite of the fact that she was the first female economics Nobel laureate, right? She started off in political science and she veered into economics. She was interested in resource management, like how it is that some communities manage their resources extremely wisely. Like where resources could be anything really like fresh water, fish stock, uh, reputation, you know, clean air, uh, what have you. In many places, communities sort of fix these problems. In other places, they don't, right? So in some places, we have overfishing and overpopulation and desertification and whatever. And so her question was, what is there that, w- what is it that makes the difference between these two cases? And her answer was, it's institutions, where institutions are like systems of rules that govern people's behavior and that constrain our behavior, but that we abide by, that we um, subject ourselves to voluntarily because we appreciate that the institutions are so obviously in our interest. This might sound counterintuitive, right? Why would people voluntarily subject themselves to all sorts of like rules and stuff? Well, Mm -hmm. if you know that your access to drinking water depends on everyone in the community, you know, only taking their share. And if you know that in the absence of any rules, like everyone will just go for it and the water will be depleted, Mm -hmm. well, then it's in your interest to abide by this. And um, part of the story here is that institutions are best, they work best, according to Ostrom, if they operate at the right sort of level. So if you're trying to fix access to a, a I don't know, water supply, like a well or something. Well, then the proper institution involves the people living around the well. If you're talking about a fish stock in a lake, well, the relevant community, Mm -hmm. the relevant institution has the size of the lake roughly. And so depending on like what you're dealing with, you might need like uh, different institutions operating at different scales Mm -hmm. and, you know, in different places. And she ended up with like a whole political philosophy, which she called or she talked about as the polycentric society, where our interactions with each other are governed by a sort of patchwork of institutions operating at different scales. And this is kind of cool because so many of us are primed to think about uh the binary of like the market versus the government Mm -hmm. or the individual versus the collective, right? You think about left-right arguments as, you know, should the market Mm -hmm. do it or should the government do it? But one of the things that Ostrom pointed out is that these institutions sort of operate on an intermediate scale or they sort of, you know, they don't fall into this binary. They're they're at odds with the the binary because an an institution isn't quite a free market solution. It's not just handing it out over to the free market. It's not a government solution either necessarily. In fact, these institutions are typically like distinct from, from the government and they need a certain degree of autonomy from the government to operate at all. Mm. And, you know, you think about the binary the, between the, the individual and the collective, which also sort of runs through discussions between le- left and right in America. Institutions aren't quite, you know, individual solutions, but they're not quite collective <laughs> solutions either in the sense that we talk about, like the state of California doing something or, you know, the federal government doing something. So it's a very appealing vision of society, I think. And it has the virtue of being like relatively appealing to people from the left and right alike. If you like autonomy, right? If you like self-determination, if you think communities should have a great deal of say over how resources are managed, you know, in the community. Well, this is a this is a pretty appealing 
uh, vision. The example that you mentioned is um, just happens to be like an example I know well, which is this mm -hmm. little swimming association in the town where my family has been summering for like five generations or something. Um, the association was founded after two little girls drowned in the harbor. Uh, they were mere feet from safety, but they didn't know how to swim. And so they couldn't get themselves back to shore. The harbor had been recently dredged, so they didn't realize that um, it was deep where there had previously been like shallow sands. And so the community came together and formed this association and just basically like decided together that from here on out, like everything, every child should learn to, to swim. The association is still going strong, like 85 years later or, or something like everybody I know in the community learned to swim in mm -hmm. this um, organization. And it's sort of cool in multiple ways, in part because it doesn't get any funding from the government, from the city government or the national government or anything. It's entirely self-funded. And it's hit on sort of ways of like raising funds um, that work in the context um, and that I don't know if they're used elsewhere. So Sweden doesn't have where I live, doesn't have like a strong history of like charitable donations. You don't just like go mm -hmm. to people and ask for money. People don't put names on things the way we do in America, <laughs> like quite so much. And so you can't just like raise funds by asking for, for money. What the um, association figured out that you can do, though, is that you can have like a little auction where people donate baked goods or paintings, you know, homemade mm. arts and crafts and things. And then you auction them off to the same group of people, right, effectively. But people will bid the most absurd amounts for these things. So people will pay like $100 or more for some cinnamon buns or a homemade cake or something. And it's like a wonderful solution in context because it allows people who have excess money to give it up, right? In exchange for, you know, reputation in the community and, you know, um, they, they get to annoy their neighbors, right? Because there's some competition <laughs> going on. Um, the people with the money have, you know, get to donate the money. People who don't have any money don't need to bid um, these absurd amounts. And so it manages to extract, like, just the right amount of money from just the people who have it. And everyone mm. leaves like super happy with themselves, right? <laughs> it's neat. Well, and um, the problem is solved without resorting to either a pure market or a pure centralized government solution. Exactly right. And so um, the association <clears throat> uh, doesn't own anything effectively, but it also operates as a liaison with the city government. So the city owns the, the beach and they control like certain aspects of, of that. Mm -hmm. But the city, instead of just going to like random citizens to ask, how do you want the beach to be organized? You know, what sort of services do you want? They come to the association and they ask. And so the association also asks, operates as a sort of intermediary between the individuals and the, the government. So again, you sort of go beyond these like traditional binaries, which is really quite, quite appealing. And I'm thinking like in an era, like the one where we're living now with this like extreme polarization um, all over the place, left and right or whatever, I think this kind of work sort of upholds the promise of solutions that at least many of us could in principle agree on. So maybe you and I don't agree on like every question in political philosophy, but if we live in the same community and we're worried about the same thing, like access to clean drinking water, um, you know, kids not drowning in the harbor and whatever, we can nonetheless come together and hit on solutions that we can all be, be happy with. And I think that's like real mm. promising. That's right. Yeah, and I, when I think of my uh, economics professors, I probably would blame them for this idea of sort of economic man that you were describing right, before. Right. And if you believe in that idea of the sort of super rational decision maker, economic agent, it seems like these institutions wouldn't work. This, so this is a cool paradox. So on the one hand, economics is like very strongly associated with this most sort of absurd rational selfishness, right? Mm -hmm. The rational, mm -hmm. selfish, economic man and whatever. But there's a, and that, that idea exists in economics, right? It's been there for a good long time. That's where but I learned it. But that's where you learned it. This is where I <laughs> learned it. <laughs> but there's like a parallel tradition 
that looks at how we overcome the sort of problems that rational economic man gets himself into. So like mm -hmm. all the social dilemmas, right? Uh, prisoner's dilemmas, like trust games, situations where you and me acting rationally independently will get us to some place where neither one of us wants to be. And so at the same time as economics is like most to blame, maybe for perpetuating this fiction, it's also the discipline that's thought the longest and the hardest, I think, about how to overcome the sort of pickle that rational, selfish individuals get themselves into. Right. But to your point, it's done a terrible job of marketing this branch of economics. <clears throat> Oh, gosh, yeah. Like the PR department of economics, like it's just god awful. <laughs> I mean, I followed, I followed your references and found this, you know, Beyond Markets and States, uh, her paper, which I think is taken from her Nobel lecture. That's right. Which is just a fantastic paper. It's beautiful. I, mean, I got a whole bunch of good ideas out of it. So thanks for the reference. I'm glad to uh, hear that. <laughs> but, you know, what I learned in economics was a rational, you know, economic man and tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. Right. And this just throws a huge monkey wrench into that way I'm of thinking. Yeah, right. to be complicating things a little. That's, so that's what oh. I got too. And then I but in political science they had rational actor, but the, by the time I was finishing poli sci it was like, Yeah, rookies think about rational actor, but there's all culture, there's all these other things that yeah, are driving yeah. nations to make to make decisions. So interesting yeah. how it evolves over time. So on the PR point, people think of economics as the dismal science, right? Mm -hmm. It's a mm. tag that's or you know, moniker that's been following the discipline along for you know, mm -hmm. a good long time. Um, and there are aspects of economics that are kind of dismal. Um, but one of the points I'm trying to make really sort of throughout this book, and one of the reasons why I wanted to write it in the first place is that there's a real hopeful message underlying much of this research. So sure, as economists, like we study all sorts of things that go wrong, <laughs> right? The desertification <laughs> and the overfishing and, and so on. Mm -hmm. But we also study the solutions to it. We see that some communities manage to hit on solutions to the problems that they're facing. And when it comes to many of the problems that, you know, people are legitimately worried about, like climate change and poverty and unhappiness and so on. There are, you know, ideas out there that, you know, I can't say that there are solutions guaranteed to work because obviously, right, there are no solutions guaranteed to work. But there are solutions that economists have looked at for a good long time and sort of settled on. So when it comes to climate change, right, I think this is particularly cool. I and mean, we have all these debates about what, what to do with climate change. And lots of people worry if we can do anything about it at all or if, you know, we're screwed. But if you ask economists, like 98% or something agree on what the solution looks like. They just want carbon taxes, right? They want to, you know, make sure the polluters pay. And then they want to mm -hmm. take that money and give it back to the people um, in such a way that you give an incentive to move away from like carbon intensive industries, you uh, innovate, you have an incentive to innovate and mm -hmm. you like compensate poor people who, you know, would pay the cost if they didn't get like something, mm. something in return. It's kind of like a solution out there. Um, overwhelmingly economists uh, agree on it. And so again, you know, we have this like extremely polarized discussion about climate change, but mm. if you handed the reins over to economists, like they would just get a carbon tax sorted and in and of itself, maybe it wouldn't fix the problem, but I bet it would go a long way toward fixing it. And we don't have to be quite as polarized. I don't think about all these mm. things. Yeah. This is a centralized solution though, not an institution. It's a centralized solution in the sense that you need like a central government to collect the tax, right? And hand it back out to, to people. And for that reason, you can sort of expect it to be appealing to people on the left, right? They mm -hmm. want the government to sort of, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, point, uh, shove people around, whatever. But it preserves the very important part, um, role of the market. It preserves the role of the price system, um, which are things that conservatives and classical liberals care about a lot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Why do markets work? Well, they work because we have these prices that fluctuate um, and that give us information about, mm -hmm. you know, what to produce and what to consume and, and so on. And you preserve that by having one of these like Pigouvian taxes as, as they call it. And so uh, on the sort of depolarization 
front here's a solution that like the green movement should be into like climate activists should be into it like the left should be into it but conservatives and classical liberals should kind of be into it too certainly by comparison to like whatever the alternative might look mm. like and christians right uh, we were put here to take care of creation this is our you know our central job or one of them anyway. And, you know, um, it really ought to be possible to build like solid foundations behind some of these proposals, even when people otherwise disagree about, you know, fundamental questions of religion and uh, political philosophy and so on. Uh, a few things, Eric, I know it's late, but do you have an additional 15 minutes? Yeah, sure. Uh, Joe has, like to to talk to Joe has to leave at one o'clock. But Joe, do you have <laughs> do you have a question you want to bring up in like two minutes? Well, I'm very interested in this point you made about uh, economics being maybe unfairly branded as the dismal science, and it feels like there was some inside baseball there where that branding was used in an awkward or this unfair is why I way. love Joe because that was my question too because you had a <laughs> okay. banger of a point in the book, Eric. Don't yeah yeah. Don't steal your own yeah. stuff. Go for it. Go I was for it, surprised Eric. Go. you glossed over that. Yeah, rip so, on it. Go. So where did this come from? Well, there was a debate between John Stuart Mill and Thomas Carlyle back in the 1800s, right, where um, Carlyle dismissed economics as a dismal science. Now, why did he dismiss it in those terms? Was it because economists are like so focused on material things or whatever? No, he dismissed it because economists like John Stuart Mill were against slavery. Um, and uh, Carlyle was, was for it. And he thought uh, uh, it was just like pathetic for economists to argue against slavery. And um, the term dismal really has like a deeply racist connotation because it's associated with darkness and the devil and mm. hell and so on. And so it was like a, a, an oblique reference to like the dark skin of the slaves whom Carlyle thought were unfit. Uh, I forget the way he put it, but fit only for the whip or something. I mean, Carlyle mm. was viciously racist. And um, I bet you that the people who used the term the dismal science, unironically to dismiss economics, who often tend to be like liberals, I think of, of various kinds, have no idea that it's a straight up like white supremacist notion. Mm. Interesting. And you're right. I mean, I, economists should be proud of this, right? The PR department should be pushing this point. I don't know what they're doing. Sleep and switch. Yeah, yeah I, you got to be put in charge of marketing for, for economic <laughs> for discipline. <clears throat> yeah, I always, when I thought discipline science, I thought because of like, if you look at the sciences of like physics, that's very like clean, there's hardcore, there's laws, you just can't argue against for economics sometimes it can be it's tougher to there's no there's no hard laws like i mean there's supply and demand mm. things like that but that's why i was looking at dismal of like oh you can't get reproduce reproducibility the same way you would get yeah. easily as yeah, in physics yeah. but this is like mind-blowing so thank you no, i had no like... idea about this whole carlisle thing my my feeling about the dismal science was more the sense of everything is limited all resources are a problem uh... so you always have to operate within that framework I mean, no matter what you expect, like where you think that story is going, it's like so much worse than you imagine, right? Yes, it's much worse. <laughs> ink, ink blot test basically could be in jail. <laughs> yeah. It is yeah. true that economists often underscore scarcity, right? The fact that things aren't as plentiful as we would want them mm -hmm. to be. Scarcity in the sense that there isn't as much as we would like to, to have. And it's the scarcity that forces 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 us to make choices right that's where the trade-offs come from and you know that's kind of annoying uh nobody likes to be told that they can't have everything they want uh right and so to that extent i guess economists are guilty of you know being boring um or something but sometimes no, they're no, right you're like you can't you're have everything forcing we want. discipline that's the worst part of all <laughs> yeah it's like, yeah, you can't cut taxes, increase spending. It's going to lead to issue. Well, you must have been dying when uh, six, seven years ago when we were in a ZERP environment, low interest rates, and these modern monetary theorists are coming out. They're saying, hey, we just print everything, and we're going to have low interest rates in America, and things are going to be great. Um, so, yeah. Uh, let's go to two other things I want to talk about. Um, you have the economic view on um, happiness and then economics views on how to build a community. So we'll start. It's like, what is what is the economist take on happiness? Um, are there so, things that? Go ahead. 
Yeah, so happiness is something economists have studied for like 50 years, right? They didn't start it in fairness. Like psychologists started this like literally 100 years ago. But um, economists took that ball and ran with it starting in the early 70s. And so we've studied like, things like happiness and money and, you know, related phenomena for a good long time. Um, there are others who are studying happiness as well, but economists are really good with data. They're really good with large data sets. And so I think on the whole, they've made like massive contributions to this to this literature. And so like one of the things, obviously, is the relationship with money, right? Um, mm -hmm. People say you can't buy happiness for money or money won't buy happiness or whatever. That has never been true. Or um, economists have like always been convinced that that's false, right? Since the very beginning of this kind of research, like 50 years or more ago, um, economists are agreed that if you don't have too much to begin with anyway, getting more money is going to make you happier. There's been some discussion about what happens on the other side of the income uh, scale. So when people are really rich, do they keep getting happier mm. when they get more money? Right now, mm -hmm. it seems as though they they do. Like So you get happier the more money you get at every step along the way. However, and this will come as no surprise if you've done any economics at all, the marginal effect is diminishing. So if you're mm -hmm. poor and you get a little more money, you can expect a big jump in, in happiness. If you're rich and you get a little more money, you can expect a smaller uh, increase in, in mm -hmm. happiness. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that you should always try to make more money? No, because again, you have to think about the opportunity costs. If you're rich enough that an additional dollar wouldn't give you a lot of happiness, but a decrease in uh, work hours, an increase in leisure would give you more satisfaction than that. What economics says is that you should be working less, right? You should be making mm -hmm. less money and you should enjoy your time off. Um, and there is, in fact, research suggesting, you know, strongly indicating that people who don't work too much are happier than people than people who do. And right. so, you know, I saw a study uh, where it was yeah. if you were, um, if you had an hour commute and then you moved closer, it became a 15 minute commute. It, the happiness that you got from it was like getting a 20% salary increase. Commutes are deadening. It's like one of yeah. these things, you know, as individuals, we say to ourselves, wow, like that big house, like in the suburbs looks so nice, an extra half hour drive or something, that's going to make much of a difference. But it really does make a big difference for happiness scores. And the bigger house won't make you as happy as you think it does. So like on the whole, like moving to a bigger house further out in the suburbs is probably not a good idea from the point of view of, of happiness. Part of the problem is that we don't always anticipate these effects. Like we need scientists to tell us that these are the consequences of making the decisions. And for that reason, reading up on the economics of happiness can give you like really good clues to how you should live your life. What are some other ways that people are screwing up the economics of happiness? Well, comparing themselves to others is like a massive mistake, right? You have this idea of like keeping up with the Joneses. Mm -hmm. If your sense of value and self-satisfaction is premised on having a nicer car than your neighbor, right? You can get that by buying a nicer car. But if your neighbor thinks the same way, well, then he's going to buy a nicer car to beat you. And then there's going to be this like ratcheting up effect where you're going to mm -hmm. keep investing more and more in cars. It's going to be like an arms race relative to each other. You haven't gained anything, but you've sacrificed a ton of other consumption and leisure time and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's like a massive mistake. Um, rising aspiration levels seem to be tricky as well. Like if you get your first apartment, you have a tiny little studio apartment, whatever, you're very happy because it's your first apartment. And then you say to yourself, ah, oh, you know, two bedroom would be nice because, you know, a little more space. And then when you have that, you say to yourself, oh, four bedroom is what I need. And then, you know, I need a seven bedroom home in the suburbs, whatever. If your aspiration level or what you sort of demand to live a good life, you know, to be minimally happy keeps rising at the same pace that your accumulation does. Well, then there's no reason to think you'll be any happier over time as you get more and more stuff, mm. right? 
And this might help explain why, in spite of the fact that we're so outrageously rich on the average, <laughs> um, we're not quite as happy as we maybe think we, we ought to be, right? We don't realize how good we have it because we keep adapting and we keep like ratcheting up yeah. our expectations. Lifestyle inflation. Right. Yeah, that's it. It's brutal in the Bay Area too. Um, I bet. I, I, right now, if you go to Blind, Blind's a, Blind is an app that is a thief of happiness because people do all their posts with, my total compensation is $500,000 <laughs> and my net worth is $10 million, but I feel like I'm poor and I should have $20 million. Uh, and, and Any economist reading this is like, do these people know <laughs> that like most Americans don't have like $1,000 in their savings account and these people are acting like their lives are over? Um, right. So let's go to the next one. Uh, yeah. About economics on building a community. We have a community here for our six supporters um, on Discord. It's a hundred plus members. So we're always trying to learn about how to make the community better. So Brilliant. what does economics say about building vibrant communities? So this is effectively what Ostrom was talking about when she talked about the institutions, right? Uh, institutions are like the fabric of society. It's what makes mm. for, you know, a functioning community that makes for strong communities. And so the way I think about this is, you know, in my community, in my neighborhood, whatever, there are all sorts of organizations and institutions. Some of them are sort of informal, a bunch of people just walking around the block with their strollers together. Others are more organized, like a tennis club or a golf mm. club or, or whatever. But all of these institutions together, all of these like organizations together make for like a real rich tapestry of uh, relationships, right? that help us uh, solve problems, adjudicate conflict, um, make our life run smoother, and so on. And so nurturing that is like really critical. So uh, we have three kids. My wife and I both work. This means that oftentimes we have trouble with childcare, right? Both of us have to be away at some point when they have to go someplace. And the solution to that is like, you know, to have a rich community and people around you whom you trust where somebody can pick up your kid when they're picking up theirs like on Monday and then you pick up their kid on Tuesday. And if the kid is at your house around dinner time, you feed them, right? So they're fed. Somebody else will take them to soccer practice. And w once you have that sort of arrangement or, you know, uh, reciprocal as a system of reciprocal relationships, you can accomplish like a ton of things that you couldn't accomplish on your own. And these are not things you can buy in a market, right? Um, a neighbor whom you trust is not the sort mm. of thing you can throw money at and just get like a babysitter, fine. But uh, a neighbor that you trust is not the sort of thing you can buy in the market. It's only the sort of thing you can get by being a member of a community and contributing to it to the best of, of your ability. Again, maybe not the sort of thing you associate with economists, but I think it's true. And I think it comes right out of the sort of research that we were talking mm. about. She, she describes uh, multiple, and, and you were also describing this idea of multiple overlapping sort of organizations. Yeah. And I think in her work, it was like studying police organizations in California somewhere. And yeah, my reaction to that was like, I would have been on the side of the people who were irritated that these overlapping organizations were inefficient, blah, right. blah, blah. Tell yeah. Us about that. So, so this was in the LA area. So she was studying the fact that there were like multiple police departments with like overlapping um, areas of uh, what's it called? Uh, jurisdictions. Like, yeah, jurisdictions. It sounds like you know absurd, right? Obviously, what you want is like you know one organization or like organizations with well-defined well defined boundaries. But her finding was that it kind of worked um, because there were smaller police organizations that were like more responsive to their communities, bigger ones that dealt with bigger problems and whatever. And so these sort of patchworks of institutions might look absurd, but there's a sense in which they kind of work. Now, what do we have here? That was showing the a concept of polycentric organizations, but oh, it was great. focusing yeah. more on like environmental stuff because sometimes when you're in the bottom level, you're like, wait a minute, like California water, you have like our, our county involved, the city's involved, the state's involved, the federal government's right. involved. But then it ties to your point of there's certain problems that are bigger than the city and county level and you need maybe federal involvement in some, in some regard. So, yeah. 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 Now that you were describing it too, it reminds me of, um, Jane Jacobs and how she talks about the social organizations on a, 
on a street in New York, you know, all the different kind of overlapping family groups. And as you pointed out, like yeah. some neighbor you can trust. Right. Yeah. And it's also sort of uh, the way you described it is kind of overlapping with, I guess it's, I want to say Kenneth Arrow, like the, the idea of trust in economics and how, how, li how little we seem to value it and how important it is. Yeah, trust has been something of like a sleeper topic. It hasn't attracted as much attention as it should have. But again, like if we didn't see the importance of trust before, we certainly did during the pandemic. Because mm -hmm. if you look at, you know, who the people are, hesitate to vaccinate themselves and their kids and whatever, the missing piece of the puzzle is often not knowledge. It appears that the people who hesitate to vaccinate their kids and themselves aren't like ignorant by comparison to other people. The sort of missing piece is the trust, really. Many people don't trust their government. And, you know, to be honest, for good reason, right? <laughs> Many people don't trust the police force, again, for good reason. Um, some people don't trust scientists, governments, and um, you know, government experts, and, and so on. And so if you want to accomplish things, um, very often the sort of thing that you want to pay attention to is what does the levels of trust look like here? Do people trust you? If not, maybe that's where you should start, right? If, if you're an expert in some domain, you want people to know what you know, you can't just go to them and like start lecturing at them, right? You might need to begin by sort of building trust. And that's, again, something that, you know, maybe we've studied in economics and the social sciences, but we haven't really practiced. Um, people don't like economists much. People don't <laughs> trust economists much. We really don't have a very good reputation, right? There are more jokes about economists than there are about lawyers, from what I understand. Right? Really? This is... <laughs> I'm mostly guessing. You can Google it. <laughs> there are lots of jokes about economists. Let me just say that. Um, and so this is something that isn't, it's not just economists, right? It's like every scientist who has something to, to share, climate scientists, sociologists, whatever, like building trust is going to be critical. Um, yeah, uh, we have, uh, fractals mentioned trust. Yes. I've watched my own community struggle with trust. It's a matter I've noticed and have been observing on reporting to the leadership. Um, so I mean, what are your thoughts on why uh, you don't have to have, have an answer or anything on why we're finding maybe certain trust levels in the West are, from what I've been seeing, are going down? Um, is it the nature of how our economy is working? Mm -hmm. We're doing more things virtually. We're not going to be one on one with people interacting with our community. What 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 do you think is going on here, or is it maybe being overstated? What are your you know, are? I'm not on top of that literature. So in the spirit mm -hmm. of epistemic humility, I sort uh, of feel like I should pass. That's why I asked you that question, uh, just to get you to say it. <laughs> that was a good answer. Time yeah. it together. Yeah, yeah, it's hard, right? I think mm -hmm. part, so to go back to that topic, there's this like conversational norm where in the conversation, you're trying to help out. If you're right. asking me like genuine question, I want to help, right? I want to have an answer. And so maybe I can trick myself into thinking that I know anything about this, which is part of why we need to be mindful of like stopping ourselves before we start making things up. And that's a great point to end this book, uh, end this talk. <laughs> um, we have three free copies of Eric's great book on how economics can save the world. If you're a Discord member, all you got to do is go into our book giveaway and just do a thumbs up to get access. If you're on Patreon, you're a free member, go to patreon.com forward slash SVIC and just comment and you'll get access to it. Um, Eric, thank you so much for writing this book. We appreciate it. And thank you for having me on the show. We want to have you on again because um, you did a really good job in this book. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. And also, this show only continues with help from viewers like you. Go to patreon.com forward slash SVIC, and you can contribute to the show for just $2.99 a month to get access to our Discord, plus our research summaries, and get access to one of the greatest private tech communities there is. And for 5 bucks a month, you get access to our bonus episodes. Also, while you're at it, if you're looking for more content, check out these two videos here. Talk to you later. Bye.